Hi, everybody. Welcome to this interview. I have here Dr. Joseph Koppen and Dr. Elizabeth Nelson, who are authors of the third, now third edition of this book, The Art of Inquiry, A Depth Psychological Perspective. And we're going to talk to them about this book. I'm Dr. Craig Chalkwist. I'm Associate Provost at Pacifica Graduate Institute, and I do some teaching in the integrative therapy and healing specialization as well. So I want to warmly welcome Joe and Elizabeth here. And before I ask some questions, I wanted to uh, acquaint you with their professional biographies very quickly. So Dr. Joseph Koppen is Professor Emeritus at Pacifica, where he has been on the core faculty for nearly 20 years, including eight years as chair of the Depth Psychology Program. He has been a psychotherapist in the tradition of depth psychology for over 35 years. His training and background in Freudian, Jungian, and archetypal psychology have blended clinical experience with teaching, writing, research, and consultation, and he currently lives in Grass Valley, California. Dr. Elizabeth Nelson is a professor at Pacifica, where she has been teaching since 2003. She designed the research curriculum for two different Pacifica programs and teaches research methodology, scholarly writing, and dissertation development. Dr. Nelson has degrees in economics, political science, and literature, and more than 30 years of experience as a writer and editor for clients in technology, health, and finance, and continues to coach aspiring writers. He's also the author of Psyche's Knife, Archetypal Explorations of Love and Power. So again, welcome to both of you, and thanks for making time for this uh, conversation this morning. It's a real joy, Craig. Good, good to talk with you. Elizabeth, always good to talk with you. Always, Joe. Thank you so much, Craig, for the invitation. <clears throat> so to get started, uh, what prompted both of you to write The Art of Inquiry? Well, I'm going to take the first run at that. My recollection, although understand that was 15 years ago, and that's a long, long time to remember, but my recollection was that uh, we were actually having a conversation that, that lasted for several months when we would get together and have this conversation. We did that casual conversation conti con would continue to devolve into talks about research. And what we both uh, recognized was that we actually – were enjoying doing research for the first time in our lives. Other, other uh, research we, did, we had done in the past had been kind of dry and, and difficult and deadening in some ways. But what we were doing as colleagues at Pacifica was alive and exciting and frankly just fun. Mm -hmm. And we kept having this conversation and we kept wondering uh, aloud in the conversation, how come? Why is, why is this research so different? What makes it so different? what makes it be alive and fun. And then we actually just started writing down what we were saying. And I think my recollection is that that's kind of, at one point we said, well, let's turn this into a book. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my recollection. Elizabeth, does that jive with yours at all? It does jive with mine. Um, the only thing that I would add to that is, um, you know, I was really moved by what Jung actually did with, uh, his images, the, the figures that appeared to him, especially during that crisis period after he broke with Freud. And um, it occurred to me that for Jung, the images were very, very alive. And that was also my experience of doing research. Um, the, it wasn't just a, a conceptual approach to research, um, that there were images in the, in the research and they were very alive and very present. And also in some cases, surprisingly and maddeningly autonomous. <laughs> so we were trying to capture that. We were trying to say, so, so what is this that we're actually doing? Uh -huh. And how is this, how is this, uh, how does this go to the soul of depth psychology? Um, yeah, I think a piece of that too was recognizing that what we were studying, the content, the, the images, the ideas, um, as Elizabeth says, were, were alive, we noticed they were alive, that they had their own subjectivity. Mm. And we noticed that our, our research in the past had, 
usually proceeded from from the move of the subject object split mm -hmm. where the researcher has all the subjectivity and the material is kind of dead mm -hmm. this is a very different game this is where this this kind of research that we're talking about in the book has to do with sub with the subject of the research actually having subjectivity mm -hmm. it yeah. gets to move on its own yeah and i was also profoundly influenced by um uh, Richard Palmer's work on hermeneutics, where he says we must treat text as a living voice out of the past, that we must hear a text. Um, and that, you know, fits in really well with a lot of James Hillman's ideas about, about the, the, the voice of something being alive and present. Mm -hmm. So it was that aliveness, I think, that we were trying to um, describe and explain in the art of inquiry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so interesting to hear this from the perspective of somebody who is a student in both your courses at one point years and years ago. And uh, I think that was before you wrote the first edition. Yes. But the ideas were in the room with us. Um, Elizabeth, I, you were actually on my dissertation committee and you know, I had an archetypal psychology class with you. And because of both of those classes, I was able to, when eventually I taught research, I would tell students that there's this, this richness that happens when the content of what you're looking at becomes the process by which you look at it. Mm -hmm. is, is that kind of what you mean by, uh, a little bit of what you mean by the work having its own subjectivity? Yes. I think uh, another way of thinking about that is that the content and the subject matter of, of the research collaborate, we, we enter into a collaboration with it rather than an operation on it. Yeah. It's a very different feel. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's fun. It makes research fundamentally relational. Yes. It's relational between the researcher and the, the subject, which has its own subjectivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, um, and as part of this, I wanted to ask if you would take us through the book as, as it now is in this new third edition. Um, what prompted the third edition? This and it's an expanded edition too. So, what um, what came up for both of you relationally that gave you the idea for this? I can maybe start on this one, Joe, and okay. you can add. Um, you know, it's it's remarkable when we when we looked at the original book, we actually started writing that in two thousand and two, and then the first edition was published in two thousand and four. So as we approached this third edition. Um, there was at least a dozen years of our own thinking and and writing and teaching, um, so there was a there was a deepening uh, into our field that I think both of us experienced a, a little different differently. Um, so part of it was that part of it was you know there's just a lot more there there. Um, so. So I think it might be I think it might be worthwhile to ponder a, a you know a third edition. That's how I that's what I recall as kind of the genesis of it. Joe, how about you? Yeah, I would say I would agree with that. Although I'd add that um, from the beginning, uh, I, maybe really more from the second edition, which came quickly after the first, we were in dialogue with students and uh, people who who weren't students, people who were writing to us from other other institutions and other places in the world, uh, talking about how great the book was, but what about this? So there, there was always, uh, you know, kind of an openness to, uh, we might have to write another edition because we've left some, left some things out. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, one of the chapters in the book is called The Philosophical Commitments of Depth Psychology. And in that chapter, we, we, first of all, we, we came up at the time and uh, back then with eight philosophical commitments, but we admitted right from the very beginning that there were probably many being left out. And we invited our readers to come at us with their understanding of philosophical commitments of depth psychology that maybe we had missed. Mm -hmm. and so there was that openness to being influenced by our readers and they, they were generous with that. We, we got a, had a lot of comments about what needed to, needed to come in to the, to the third edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, our, our readers have been incredibly 
helpful to us. They've, um, they've given us feedback, they've asked questions. Um, and and I mean, for me, I guess continuously, um, I've always been inspired by the readers. And some of them are our students, which is lovely because we get to meet them in the classroom. And then some of them are, you know, beyond the classroom but it's just been such a joy to, to hear them and hear their ideas mm -hmm. and what ideas got sparked, you know, by reading The Art of Inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most surprising pieces of feedback that we consistently got, um, and, and it was, this was, we tried to wrap our heads around this for, for quite a while, is um, readers would say, well, I know you think you wrote a book about research, but it, but it's, much more than that. Yeah. It's not a book about research only, you know, which was, it's, it's a way of understanding the psyche and the lived experience of the psyche. Yeah. Surprising and gratifying. Uh -huh. I, I want to actually come back to that excellent point in a minute, but I'm thinking about how both in my own process of continuing to understand for myself what depth psychology is. And in the book you mentioned, it's a way of being. It's, it's not just a research tool, although it is that. But, uh, but also my students who often, as you both know, come into research classes sometimes a bit nervous because they have a rather mainstream idea that research is difficult and research is deadening and um, you know, whatever their, their bias is. And then they they read your book, which I've recommended, I don't know how many times to how many students. And a lot of times they immediately feel relief that, that research actually can be an art and not just a science and also a sense of enchantment. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, um, because mainstream approaches often do hold research, usually do hold research as a science, for both of you, how is it an art as well? Good question. Um, you know, again, I think that um, our, our move to focus on research as an art is a recognition of moving away from the myth of objectivity, or maybe better, um, seeing it as myth, which isn't to say it isn't true, it just has a mythic uh, quality to it. Mm -hmm. um, there is, a, there is uh, a way that objectivity um, you know, it has an important role in the way we, we occupy the planet and, and live out our lives. It, without objectivity, we would be lost in many ways. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that, and particularly I think in the realm of research, is it, it, it's a paradigm that has developed a kind of hegemony over the whole field of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the idea that maybe art is off to the side somewhere um, is something that we took on. And we just we we realize that there is an, there is a, a way to be artistically oriented to the material we study. Largely, again, I think this has to do with um, entering it, entering the, the domain of research or the activity of research with an eye toward creativity and not just our own creativity, but the natural creativity of the field we're interested in in learning about. Mm -hmm. And so, as an artist picks up the, the tools and the medium and the materials of, of their practice, they enter into a kind of collaborative activity with that material that allows what, what needs to show forth to come forth. It's a different idea mm -hmm. from, from the typical objective idea, from, from research as a science. It isn't to say that, that there shouldn't be scientific research, we would never take that stance, mm -hmm. but that art, art is also research and research can also be art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add to that, be beautifully said, Joe, the only thing that I would add to that is that um, we also aren't giving up some of the values of a scientific approach. If by scientific you mean systematic and thorough uh, and attentive, mm -hmm. um, those are all things that are still very much a part of inquiry as, as we think of it. But it does, uh, art, the art of inquiry, I think, does emphasize the relational and collaborative and creative aspect, as mm -hmm. Joe was just saying. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of uh, a recent lecture by Oksana Yakushko, who's chair of our clinical programs. And 
Uh, she was speaking a couple of weeks ago at one of our information days, and she made the point that uh, similar actually to what you're both saying about the sort of positivistic, um, rationalistic way of doing science becoming a, a dominating force rather than just a research paradigm, but also mm -hmm. that, that we were thinking about it more integrally, that we weren't rejecting it and throwing out, as Young loved to say, the baby with the bathwater, you know, but we were also understanding the underlying fantasies of what, what's in that approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very important. Your book very much makes clear. And in your book, you, you distinguish between methodologies and moves. And it seems to me that this is part of what we're talking about right now. Exactly. I think that was one of the early epiphanies for us in, in working with the book is, and, and we should really credit James Hillman with the idea of moves. He saw mm -hmm. um, psychological method in, in terms of, you know, the practical way of approaching psychology as, as better thought of as a set of moves which, which evokes the image, if you, if you allow it to, it evokes the image of the dancer moving with the material in kind of a, uh, a cooperative, collaborative way and responding to what's alive uh, in, in that rather than applying a set of me methodological rigors onto the material. We're actually moving with the material. So that idea was, was strong for us. And it, then ultimately, it, it was it was pretty easy to sit down and say, well, what are these moves, and how do they feel as lived experience? What is what's the phenomenology of this kind of research? Mm -hmm. And that gave rise to the, one of the chapters in the book that's been there really from the beginning is the chapter on the moves of psychological inquiry. Mm -hmm. And I think the other the other emphasis on moves is that we wanted um, to give our students some some practical uh, tips, some some hints, some some uh, some steps, some some moves, so that regardless of which methodology they chose for their study, um, it could still be infused with uh, with psyche, you know, with with a depth psychological perspective. So we make a real clear distinction between methodology, of which there are many. And these individual moves that actually can be applied regardless of whether you're doing uh, case study, narrative inquiry, uh, phenomenology. Um, in other words, at the level of moves, one can still, I'll borrow Joe's phrase, we can, one can still dance with the psyche. I love that way of holding it. It's, um, it, it's soulful. And I actually wanted to ask about that too. You, in the book, you talk a lot about soul and research and <laughs> dancing at being such a soulful way of moving with one's partner or, or the the other dancers and when you when you use that word soul what do you mean by it small question <laughs> <laughs> very small question right mm -hmm. well you know I go, I go back to well it's it's interesting we use the word soul and we use the word psyche and and we we're ecumenical about that. Um, but there are times when the word soul seems more fitting than the word psyche. Um, you know, for me, when I think of soul, again, I, I kind of go to uh, Hillman's sense of the deep interiority of, of all things, mm -hmm. uh, human beings, um, trees, um, the deep interiority of the bookshelf I'm looking at right now. You know, all things have a deep interiority and that it's, that's its soul quality. And the other piece of it that's very important to me is value. That soul is, I believe, that faculty that gives us our sense of values. Mm. Um, yeah, that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think I have a lot to add to that, except again, I would just want to credit our, our use of the term, even the interchangeable way we, we use it with psyche, um, to credit that to uh, Hillman, to James Hillman, who is always reminding us that we live in an, in an ensouled world, mm -hmm. that, that the material we engage with and the, the rocks, the, tr the trees, the animals, the people, the ideas as well, uh, they're all ensouled, they're all alive, they all have, um, a claim on us to to treat them ethically as 
as living beings that we share our existence with. And that, that idea uh, is really a kind of a core philosophical commitment in depth psychology. And it's, it's, a, it's kind of a core understanding in the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some years ago, I went to a qualitative research conference, that big one that they have in, um, uh, at, what is it, Urbana Champagne every year. And um, one of the panels I went to was facilitated by two First Nations researchers, and I forget which tribes, but they, were, they weren't getting into methodology so much. They were describing more of their tribal protocols. And one of the things they said was that the, the actual place where you do research is an important partner. And I was thinking about that just now when you were mentioning the world being ensouled and how research, as you describe it in the book, takes the outer world seriously instead of operating on it or looking at it as sort of a backdrop to the really interesting human things that happen. And so I was wondering if you could think of one or two examples of how research as you've taught it over the years has shown up with that strong dimension of the world in, in the work of the students that you've been with. Mm. Uh, that's a great question. You know, I, uh, I don't want to narrow this uh, question too um, prematurely, but I would say that one of the, one of the uh, areas of study that's, that our students enter into that really gives support to what you're talking about, Craig, is, is deep ecology or eco-psychology, eco mm -hmm. that, the, that the study of place, the study in place of place, meaning one has to actually go to a place and, and be in that space in order to, to make the moves of collaboration to, to take up what's really there and alive. Yeah. I think the, the um, depth ecology, eco-psychology kinds of studies that, are, that some of our students engage in um, really kind of respond to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think another way that it shows up is if someone is doing participant-based research, um, that a lot of attention is given to where that, let's say, where the interview is going to be held. Mm -hmm. uh, I can think of one of my students who was making a choice between interviewing his participants in their home or interviewing them at his office. And he made the choice to interview them in their home. And as a result, the, the interviews were just much richer because of the, of the context uh, mm. and, and, the, and the topic had to do with um, the, the participants' home life to, to some extent. So there was a sense of, if you will, the, the atmosphere of the interview space itself mm. was more uh, charged. Mm. Um, it was richer in, in context. It was more alive. Mm. Of course, um, your own background, Craig, and, and the, your book on terror psychology, I think, provide an, another excellent example of that, that uh, way that the, that the landscape actually plays into our understanding of the material. Mm. In reading so much um, mainstream research and, and checking with my own reactions about it, I find that when it's deprived of the kind of context that the three of us are talking about, there's a, I feel this kind of dissociation and also boredom. Um, it, it's as though so much of the, the ensouled world and the ensouled relations that we have between each other are left out and things mm -hmm. brought down to the point where, you know, can we shed knowledge on this little piece over here or that disconnected piece over there? And yeah. I always think of that um, Middle Eastern joke about how uh, and a parable, actually, an old piece of folklore about searching for one's lost possessions where the lamp is because the light's better there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's really going where the, the aliveness is, where the, where the spirit of place is, or just the, the heart and concern of the work that we do, you know. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to another question, which is, um, it seems like what we're also talking about here is depth. And so in using a depth psychological series of moves and, and dancing with 
um, our research that way. What do you, here's another tiny question. What do you mean by depth in that conversation? <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a brief story about that question. Uh, James Hillman came into one of my research cl classes. Um, oh, this was uh, several years ago. Um, uh, for about an hour and a half presentation, and his presentation consisted in, in asking the students, what is death? <laughs> and then the conversation just unrolled for the next 90 minutes without one pause. Yes. So, yes, that's a, a small question. Um, you know, I guess when I think of depth, I, I, I tend to think of, of a couple of images that have been very poignant to me since I was a child. Um, I think of oceanography and I think of archaeology. Um, those were the two things that I wanted to be when I grew up, an mm. oceanographer and, and an archaeologist. Mm. Um, and, um, and both of them to me suggest the absolute love of the, of the, of the endlessly receding horizon. Mm. You know, just the sheer delight of exploration and, and delight in, in mystery, the delight in tantalizing questions, that the gap between what the researcher now knows and what they ultimately can know is not a place of frustration or mourning. It's a place of excitement. Mm. That's how I see it. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to double that a little bit, um, because and first of all, though I, I would I would join with you in the idea that we're talking that depth is a is a kind of felt sense of the difference between the known and the yet to be known. That in other words, there's there's a kind of a uh, just a sense that we have that that feels really in our bodies, if you will, that there's something we don't know yet that might that might actually be quite pertinent or or deeply necessary yeah. um, and so that that kind of urgency uh, comes into the, in, into my sense of depth but I would also say that it isn't always wonderful <laughs> <laughs> I would also say that you know that one of one of the reasons that the depth psychological perspective is so important in research I think is that it proceeds from a healthy respect of what the symptom wants mm. Yep. And so symptomology is, is really important. Engagement with the symptom, the suffering of the pain, the suffering of the knowing there's something we don't know that we must know, mm -hmm. that that feeling is, is part of what also is depth in it. And it can lead to symptoms. It can, it's one of the ways that people's struggles in their lives actually land them in, in situations where they have to investigate. They have, they have no choice. They can't just simply live into this blissful moment. Yeah. So uh, that's the other side of that. And I, I know you, you know all that too, Elizabeth. Yes, uh, I, I do know all of that, but I think it's a very important reminder about the poignant side of life, no question. Yeah. I remember um, reading the feedback on a paper I wrote for your class, actually, Joe, years ago, where I was, I was undergoing a kind of green conversion experience and um, sort of waking up to the fact that the natural world had been speaking to me my whole life and I hadn't been listening to it. But I was, I was kind of going into the idealization phase of it. And in the paper, you, you very tactfully pointed out that when I talk about, you know, Gaia and the goddess and this and that, what about hurricanes? <laughs> what about insect bites? You know, <laughs> that's great. Oh yeah. Well, that's <laughs> so it goes way back to then, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the bites, the bites are there yep yeah yeah one of the things i love about the depth approach too is that in working on my own dissertation and i've seen this ever since in, in students who do d depth oriented dissertation work the things that it brings up that you were mentioning um it opens old places that we haven't looked into and it brings wounds to the surface but it also gives us a way of working with them so they don't remain in this unthought known space where we can't have any any way of dealing with them and they're scary and primal and mythological even and they begin right. to make sense and you hear what they're saying to you and that's such a powerful way of moving forward with all of them yes yeah it's huge 
Very good. And, and so much deeper than cure. Mm, yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking along that line, um, the, why do you think it's important that we understand archetypes? Such a misused, misunderstood, you know, word that gets branded as mystical oftentimes in mainstream thought, but uh, where, where did they come into this and why is it important to have a sense of how they operate? Mm -hmm. Well, I, uh, so many different answers to that question. Um, I think that uh, it, it takes me to one of the perspectives that we spent a little bit of time with in, in the book really from the beginning, which is the importance of seeing the psyche um, as both personal and more than personal. Mm -hmm. That our understanding of the, of the archetypes and the archetypal domain or the archetypal world is a way of helping us to uh, translate our own personal experience, which is often quite dramatic and strong and maybe overwhelming uh, and, and lays a claim to us that sometimes makes us feel like we can't, we'll never escape ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, the archetypal perspective enables us to begin to see those passions and struggles and quandaries um, as, yes, very personal because they hit us at a very personal level, but more than personal, mm -hmm. meaning they predate us and they, they, extend our, they extend our suffering and our knowledge and our experience out into the world in a way that we might overlook otherwise. So to remember that things also have an archetypal nature, everything, as Hillman said, has its archetypal face, is both to uh, invite a restoration of the soul of things, as we spoke of earlier, but also to remind us that, that our own personal experience has this whole other dimension mm. to it that invites us outward and into an engagement with the world that we might otherwise forget. So I think that's one piece of why it's one piece of why I teach archetypal psychology and I can't seem to give it up. Uh, it, it's because it, it always offers that, that move that you can, you can feel in your body when you realize, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just about me. Yeah. You yeah. see, this is about how I am a person in the world. Yeah. It's a connective tissue between self and world. Mm -hmm. It's a way of seeing that, that division, in, in fact, as, as an illusion. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would add to that that the archetypal approach is something that I have found specifically useful in research. Uh, and I, I approach it through image. Um, and, and again, I go, going back to Jung's idea that, that, the, that the images that come to us are autonomous, spontaneous, self-generative, uh, frustrating, wonderful, maddening, you know, all, all of those things, but they are persons, which is something that um, James Hillman emphasized quite a bit in his work, thank goodness. Um, and so I asked the students, um, who is here mm. in your research? Who is the archetypal companion who wants to be known? And the surprising thing for many students is even if they're at the very beginning of their research journey with just this nascent idea of what they will write about, um, an image comes forward within seconds. Mm -hmm. And that may or may not be the ultimate companion for their journey. It certainly probably won't be their only companion for the journey, but um, it, it relativizes this, the, 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 the legendary isolation of scholarship. Mm, nice. One may be socially isolated in the conventional <clears throat> set, but richly companioned in, in the sense of, of the images from the psyche that want to participate in, this, in the research. Mm. Well, can I just follow on to that and, and just say that over and over again, I, you know, I think I and, and Elizabeth too both have had the experience of our dissertation students finding a period in their studies where they are physically isolated in some little cube that, of privacy that they've made in their house somewhere, but feel entirely populated yeah. and entirely supported in a way that they've never felt before because the, because the landscape is filled now with these archetypal images and 
influences and voices and they and they just want to go into their study because they miss their their friends you know so it's it's an interesting paradox yeah my own experience of that as a dissertation student and the experience has never left me it's it's with me every day and it has brought me a sense of re-enchantment which is a word i've been using a lot in presentations especially at pacifica it it ensouls the world in a way that uh, your word populates it you know the invisible show up for us and and we're not alone in a way and i keep remembering too young's red book and how that happens with him as well yes and he, he feels so alone in the outer world and and not totally isolated he had his family and and companions and friends and all that but being the kind of man he was he was isolated in a different sense by a different mode of vision mm -hmm. as Hesse would put it and and then going into the red book and looking at his extended conversations with the image people that showed up for him yes. and, and often quite disturbing conversations too when they oh. would tell him things that clearly contradicted how he held certain ingrained beliefs and values and they, and they would say no that's not how we see it at all <laughs> and him being transformed by that and so you yeah. know, learning from it what a miracle how open he was to all of that and how he modeled that for us mm -hmm. it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Mm hmm. so over the years that you've taught graduate level research can you think of one or two things um let's say in class or maybe when you were reading a paper or some other setting that really surprised you about what was happening or deeply transformed you in some way, opened you up to something? Yeah, I, I think um, I would go back to um, the, the shift from method to moves was, was one of the places where that surprise occurred. And what I mean by the, by the surprise was, um, once, once we really could identify this, that shift in the, the making of the moves and the list of the moves, the fun really started to happen. And that, I think that was a pleasant surprise. Mm -hmm. it, it just opened things up to think about it in that way. And if you think about method, method is, is, is a sense of rules, a sense of, you know, we, this must follow, this must follow this, and this is how you do it, and you have to have at least this, and et cetera. So method has that way of, of applying a rigor, which isn't to say that's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you sh shift and add moves back into that, suddenly what, what you leave, you leave the regulation behind and enter the realm of possibilities. Mm -hmm. I think that that, is a, that was a pleasant surprise when we saw that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That was, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the bigger surprises for me was um, how potent the chapter on the philosophical commitments was. Mm. Um, you know, as we were writing our, our laundry list, when we were first putting that together, and we call it a laundry list in the book, um, we came up with eight commitments. And as Joe said earlier, we knew that that was, that there would be more. Um, um, I think it was the encounter with trying to understand what depth psychology was or is as a as a maybe a lived experience a living attitude uh that was encapsulated in that chapter that was the most i think that was the biggest surprise in terms of writing writing the book mm -hmm. um and it's still a very profound chapter in the book to me it feels very profound um probably the biggest shock though occurred about five years ago when I was reading a student's paper and it became very clear through the voice on the page what her archetypal companion was, or I should say uh, who her yeah. archetypal companion was. Um, the companion absolutely spoke. It was unmistakable. And that was where I really got this sense that that part of the creativity, part of the art of inquiry, you were asking about that before, is the way that um, writing is such a key part of research. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way that the, that, the, that the psyche's images, that the, that the students' archetypal companions 
show up literally on the page. Yeah. Yeah, it was astounding and wonderful. You probably, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Joe. I just wanted to add to that that, um, you know, really, I, I wouldn't classify it as a surprise because it was part of the intention of the book. <laughs> uh, maybe a surprise that it, that it came to fruition so abundantly, but mm. the, the idea over and over again that our students would share with us that, that this, this guide that we produce in the, in the text enabled them to move the research from some ordeal that they had in front of them to something that really illuminated their their lives in a in a different way, mm -hmm. so it became a psychological life rather than just a piece of research. Mm -hmm. And over and over again, students would would talk to us about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, it wasn't really a surprise because we hoped that would happen. Yeah, but it was it was great that it did. Mm -hmm. You can see that when you read the dissertations too, and you see even in the titles sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, what you were mentioning about um, the writing component of this, bringing it, helping birth what's happening imaginally, um, to put it that way. You've probably heard that old um, story that Tolkien actually mentioned in an interview, J.R.R. Tolkien, when he was grading papers at Oxford and, and feeling kind of bored. And there was an extra blank sheet that a student had accidentally left in one of the papers that he was looking at. And afterwards, he, he said, well, bless that student for, for doing that. Because he looked at the blank page, and a voice said in his ear something like, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. <laughs> and he went. At the beginning. And he started writing to, to, he wrote it down, and then he started writing to figure out, what, what's a hobbit? You know? <laughs> yeah. Later, he said the voice spoke in Elvish, and so he created his translation, if we put it that way, of Elvish to understand what the story was that was unfolding that, that wanted to speak through him. And so we know what came of that, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and The Silmarillion and everything else. But, Quite a bit. Wow. Great story. Great story. In, um, you know, in terms of what's, what's now in the book in its present third edition form, can, can you give us an overview of what's there so that people have a sense of what the book contains when they're going to pick it up. Are you talking about the third edition as opposed to, yeah. Well, actually the whole book as it now stands, uh -huh. kind of an outline of what's in it. <clears throat> wow. <laughs> I know I keep asking these questions that we could spend a week on, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth? Um, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll, give it a, I'll give it a try. So, um, so our opening chapter, we talk about what inquiry is. Yeah. And we, we make a distinction between what, we're, what we call the yin of inquiry and the, and the yang. Or, and we're, we borrow the Chinese terms to indicate two postures or attitude towards research. Uh, one is the yin of inquiry is uh, active receptivity. Uh, and the yang is more of the directed, assertive approach, the, the seeking of knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and that theme kind of flows throughout the entire book. Um, and then we have a new chapter in this edition, for those who've read the previous editions, we have a new chapter on the roots of depth psychology in uh, myth and uh, religion and uh, indigenous studies. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a beautiful chapter that, that traces the, the the deeper roots of the field, so that people don't think that depth psychology just sprang out of Freud's mind in the late nineteenth century, mm -hmm. um, but that it actually is is quite uh, closely related to these these other much older traditions, and that we owe a great deal to those older traditions. Uh, the third chapter is about the hi a short history of methodology, of research method. Um, we don't go back very far, just a few hundred years, because um, otherwise it would be a very long chapter. <laughs> um, and then uh, the fourth chapter is uh, where we talk about these philosophical commitments. Mm -hmm. So again, for those people who have read the earlier editions, we had eight philosophical commitments there. Uh, in this new chapter, in, in this chapter, we have two new commitments, um, and they are uh, the psyche is embodied, 
and the psyche is religious. Mm. Um, and when Jim and Joe and I were talking about these two commitments, we were looking at ourselves going, how in the world did we forget this the first time around? But, you know, there it is. So um, Another so example of uh -huh. how our students uh, came and clearly reminded us, what did you, what were you thinking when you left? <laughs> that, will, that will continue to happen, I'm sure. <laughs> and we hope it does. You know, how could you leave this out? <laughs> so, you know, that's, and that's so exciting because it means that they're really engaging with the book, which is just, you know, that's the best compliment an author could get. Um, so our fifth chapter is this, uh, the chapter about the moves, um, the moves of, of research. And that's a little bit expanded in this, in this edition. Um, but I remember one of our reviewers, um, Dennis Slattery, uh, also a fabulous writer himself, mm. said that he really thought that this was the heart and soul of the book. This is mm. what made the book unique. So anyway, so that's our moves chapter. Mm. Um, and then we talk about the stages of research. We're trying to give students and readers um, a sense of kind of what they can expect as they look towards the 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 landscape of research. Um, what are some of the milestones? Um, what are some of the anxieties? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we try to normalize, if you will, some of the the things that they encounter. Um, then uh, this edition has uh, the next chapter is a new chapter in this edition, and it's on uh, writing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, deep writing. What do we mean by depth psychological writing? What are the qualities of depth psychological writing? And then the final chapter is also is from the original editions. It's honoring the spirit of play. We just kind of wrap up mm -hmm. the the whole book and talk about the um, the the necessary. Who wear Senex tandem? Mm -hmm. You know the the idea of of the playful hermetic quality in research that's counterbalanced by the need for discipline and structure and limit, which is represented by the archetypal Senex. Mm -hmm. So that's a brief description. Mm -hmm. That's where we say uh, yes, have fun, but get it done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Gra graduation is good. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That's, um, you know, I'm thinking of how so many things in the book, and just to use the Puer Senex dynamic as one example of many, apply what you're writing to such wider endeavors out in the world and um, not only in research, but outside research. And even life is a way of being a permanent seeker or learner or researcher or person who sees things in a depth view, you know. Um, did you want to add anything about that particular part of the book? In, ter in other words, um, say, say a student sits down and reads your book. Um, they want to be informed about research. Perhaps they're a student at Pacifica and they're thinking about their dissertation. But they soon become aware of the fact that, well, you know, how I look at everything is now going to change. And how I bring this out into the world and dance with whatever's happening out there, you know. So... Actually, two questions. Uh, I'll come back to the Pu'er Senex one in a second. But do you, have, do you have more to say about, you know, perhaps by way of advice, maybe that's a good way to ask this, for students who are making that transition, who read the book and then they walk outside and then all these things that you're talking about are happening, how, what would you recommend in terms of how they deal with that? Mm. Craig, are you talking about about in the in the world beyond research, beyond scholarly research, mm -hmm. different ways of applying it? Yeah, or or integrating the two worlds. Integrating the two worlds. That was something I had to struggle with in in my dissertation work, and I and I've seen many other students do that too, where the myths don't stay on the page, and the process doesn't stay in the text, and you know it just shows up in your dreams and in encounters outside and. Well, it really, in some ways, that's, that's the central invitation of the book, um, to, to find ways to live a, a depth psychological life, mm -hmm. um, not so much in a preachy way, but in a more of a permissive way. To, to, for, the book invites people to do what really comes naturally for us if we don't get too rigid in our scholarly obligation. Um, but to find a way to, to let that life, uh, that 
that what we call right in the beginning of the book, the natural inclination to inquire, to be curious, to let that grow um, into a way of being in the world that feeds the scholarship and to have the scholarship feed that way of being in the world, yep. to, have them, to build a bridge in that way. Mm -hmm. And we, we find that, you know, many of our students see that right away. They, they get that, that that attitude makes the research go more smoothly and more richly. Um, but there's something that also about, about uh, uh, arriving at a place where there's a conjunctio between joy and discipline mm -hmm. that en enables a thing to get done without killing the spirit of it, mm -hmm. um, that, that students start, start to realize, well, wait a minute, this applies to, to, my, to the rest of my life as well. It's not just about the research. So the research, in a way, helps build that capacity, build that capacity into our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, um, as an example of that, to return to the Puerisenics dynamic, um, which when unhelpful can become a polarization. So for those, for those watching this who aren't familiar with these terms, Puer refers to the archetype of the divine child. And you can think of <clears throat> where you can visualize the Puer as these figures who you know, leap off the ground with joy and they're full of ideas and kind of Peter Pan and mythological figures like that. Um, young Dionysus leading the Eleusinian mysteries and even I, I like looking at how it shows up in, in actual lives. So Mozart and of his music, very puer. And then on the other side of it, but but joined to it is Senex, the old the old man, the old woman, the, the energy of the elders and of structure, sometimes visualized as Saturn energy, mm -hmm. boundaries, you know, get it done. What's the deadline? When can you have this back to me by, right? So mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask is, um, do you have some hints for students who get trapped on either end because <laughs> I over the years I've seen that and I know you have too, where either it's all divine child ideas and all intuition built and no landing and, and haven't written anything for a month and then on the other end of it there's getting stuck in the senex and being so locked up on the inside that you can't write a word that way either mm -hmm. so maybe what do you think about how that happens and how to work with it mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say uh, one simple way to work with it is to remember that they are a pair mm -hmm. and that, um, that there's a way in which w when we're riding high with puer and leaving all of, all of the um, rigor of life behind, um, there's, a, there's a way in which it, it pays to remember that Cenex must be around somewhere and that Cenex has something to say about this. And likewise, if you know, you, you find yourself just in this dark tunnel where you're you're questioning every word, every idea. You're 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 double resourcing all your thoughts. You're you're just overwhelmingly bound up with the Senex. To just to remember that there is a there is a puer around there somewhere to, to be found and has a contribution to remake to make. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think maybe what we're talking about here is our natural tendency to become one sided in the first place. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that one-sidedness is seductive because it, it, it always carries a kind of certainty, a, a kind of power that, that says it knows everything that we need to know about what's going on. Mm. And, to, and to remember that, um, that that's always a trap, to, to balance the one-sidedness with this other archetypal reality that's, that's always there, whether it's Puer and Senex or some other archetypal pair. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to remember that the two of them do belong together. They are a pair. Um, I think of them, it's interesting you mentioned Mozart. I, I think of them in terms of rhythm. Mm. Um, so, for instance, when a student is first imagining a dissertation idea, that tends to be a very puer moment because there's endless possibilities. Yeah. Um, and, and the mind just begins to expand. It's, it's very airy. It's very light. Um, another element that might be associated to that is fire. Um, so, and, and that's, that's a wonderful thing at the, at the, at the beginning of an idea. Um, but the, the Senex moment that, that follows that, that puer moment is 
all right, let's take those airy, light, fiery ideas and, and bring them down to earth. Let's, let's put them on a page. Mm -hmm. so, so write a, a one-page description of your topic or some possibilities in your dissertation topic. Yeah. So then that's the Senex moment. So you're bringing something into manifestation, something down to earth. You're, you're giving it gravity, literally, which is, you know, so that's the gravitas that's associated with the, with the Senex. And, you know, many students find that, that difficult. Actually, artists and authors in, in many fields find that, that moment of manifestation difficult. And yet, when we follow those rhythms, very often, that Senex moment will then open up into the, the puer sense of possibility again. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a little bit like another metaphor is, uh, is breathing. Yeah. It's a bit like breathing, you know, inhaling and exhaling. One sort of naturally leads into the other. Mm -hmm. Puer dynamic, the puer rhythm naturally flows into the Senex rhythm, which naturally flows back into the puer rhythm. Mm. Very nice. Mm. So um, I have a last, actually two last questions for you. Um, one is, where is your book? This is a Senex question. Where is your book available so people can buy it? <laughs> it's, well, it's available on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. It's also, I think, on the, on the Spring Publications website as well. It is indeed. And, yes. and Craig, we were going to actually twist your arm in this conversation to make sure that the bookstore is stocking the third edition now. I'll check. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. And um, my other question is, do either of you have anything to add? Anything I could have asked or anything you wanted to say here at the end? Or You know, one, one thing I, um, I want to add is... Um, Truly, none of this book would have been possible if, if we hadn't had Pacifica as a, as a kind of a nutritive seedbed to, to start things out with. Mm -hmm. um, the, when we began the interview to, uh, this morning, um, you know, we talked about how, oh, pardon, pardon me on that phone. <laughs> we, That's Pacifica calling right now. <laughs> 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 that's right you know what I was, I was teaching a myth class once and we were talking about personal myth and somebody's phone went off and the, this, the text that came up for the, on the phone was Diana right oh, <laughs> that's great, <laughs> that is great. <laughs> that's great. So, so let me finish that thought I just wanted to acknowledge that, that the, this way of thinking about research for, for Elizabeth and I really came up in our conversations early on at Pacifica, both of us having been students at Pacifica and being supported to do this kind of research. Um, so the, the book really, uh, I, I think we have to credit people like Mary Watkins and, and Robert Romanishan and, mm -hmm. and James Hillman, of course, all of whom we were exposed to at Pacifica, many others that I could mention. But um, it really it would be important to just acknowledge that connection, I think, for me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It was a very nutritive environment, I would say, for us. Um, and the only th other thing that I would add is I know of many co-author relationships that end badly. <laughs> and working with Joe has been a complete joy yeah. all the way through. Still is. Still is. You can <laughs> feel it in the book, too. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both of you for taking this time for such a wonderful conversation. Uh, I, I'm reluctant to end it, but we should. And you know, I'm, I'm summoning up my Senex side. You got to end it. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to thank both of you. And um, just to say that, although technically I'm not your student anymore, I'm still learning from you. Oh, thank well, you, Craig. Thank you for that. Thank too. you. Thank you very much, Craig. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.